Amen. Well, we're Victor Revival Center. We're a church in the city of Brantford, and we meet at 125 Blackburn Drive right now because uh, we're not able to meet at the location where we're meeting. And and uh, and so God bless you. And of course, live on Facebook, and and uh, and then the messages get recorded later and put on podcast on YouTube. And uh, uh, so you know you're welcome to listen to those you know later. Um, however, you know we want to encourage you. You know. Um, you know, to come and attend, you know, 125 Blackburn Drive and, and uh, be strengthened uh, as we meet together and gather together. Our hearts get revived, you become equipped, and you become the Reformation. And uh, so tonight we're going to celebrate communion. We're going to celebrate the Passover meal. And uh, so if you're at home uh, and, you know, grab, grab some juice, grab, grab some bread, and we're going to celebrate right after I finish preaching and, and uh, you know, together and... Um, Man, you know, it's just so exciting that, you know, the Lord gave me this, you know, that every month I was to preach on another dimension of the, of the body and the blood of Jesus. And, and so we've been on this series uh, since January um, on, on the burst uh, of the Passover lamb, you know, that, that Christ our Passover lamb. We, we've, you know, we've, we've been in this, this burst, the, the sudden intense activity uh, of Christ, uh, you know, in the past, in the present, and in the future. And uh, so we've been just kind of been studying this. Out. So turn your Bibles with me to Matthew chapter 26, Matthew chapter 26, and uh, we'll read the, the text here, and then we'll begin to develop this as we, as we go a little bit deeper into the concentrated blood of Jesus, right? You know, uh, gave me a word, you know, before the beginning of the year, that we were stepping into a season uh, where where cr the Christ, His covenant, and His in His conquest was going to be elevated. It was going to be uh, emphasized. It was that we were going to come into a new dimension of the Christ. That we were going to come into a new dimension of His covenant, and that we were going to come into a new dimension of His conquest. How many want to live in a greater dimension of His covenant? Amen. How many want to live in a greater dimension of of what He of what He conquered? You know, for us, you know, uh, you know what he conquered for us, so that we can live the life that he created us to live. You know, how many want to live in a dim deeper dimension of the Christ, the Word and the Spirit, right? A deeper dimension of the Anointed One and His anointing. How many want the anointing to flow out of you, you know, in a greater way? And and so, it really, comes out of a revelation of, of the body and blood of Jesus. Really, it comes out of of us knowing what his body paid for and what his blood was shed for. And, uh, and so let's read the text here. Very familiar passage. It's, it's one that's read, you know, every time, you know, oftentimes when we celebrate uh, communion, uh, you know, the Passover meal, um, you know, whatever, whatever, you know, words you use to, to describe the Lord's Supper, you know. But in verse 26, starting in verse 26 of Matthew 26, it says, and as they were eating, Jesus took bread, blessed and broke it, and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. And he took the cup and gave thanks, and he gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you, for this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. Such a powerful uh, passage, you know, these three verses are are so impacting when we get a revelation of what Jesus was saying to the disciples, what what he was what he's saying to you and I, that that he and what he's calling us to. See, see what he's what what is he calling us to? He's calling us to a deeper uh, union with him. If you think about you know this last supper, this meal, really it's a deeper union with him. How many want a deeper union with him? Right? So every time we celebrate, you know, and do a prophetic act, I mean, really, the, the, the communion meal, the, the Last Supper, the, you know, is a prophetic act that we do on a regular basis to, to, to create an environment uh, uh, and to establish a, a deeper relationship with him. All right? That's really what, what communion is. It's really establishing in, in a prophetic act of, of receiving taking in, uh, grabbing a hold of, seizing 
um, what his body represents, what his blood represents, what, what his body went through, what his blood uh, was shed for, so that we come into a greater dimension of union with him, with the Holy Ghost, and with the Father. And so Jesus says here, he says, he, he, he takes the bread, he blesses it, he breaks it, and he gives it to the disciples. And he says this to them, he says, take, eat, this is my body. And, and it's interesting, because really, uh, it, you know, in essence, it's a command. He's saying, take it, right? It, 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 it's, it's an invitation, and it's a command. Take it. In other words, grab a hold of it, Amen. right? Receive it, grab a hold of it, and as you grab it and receive it and, and, and seize it, I want you to now consume it. I want you to eat it, right? I want you to take it in to the place where it becomes a part of you, where it becomes established in you and in me, right? The word eat here means to chew. It means to consume to assimilate, to devour, and to live. In other words, he wants us to devour his body. He wants us to, to assimilate his body. He wants us to live his body. He wants us to chew and consume every element, every nutrient, every um, vitamin, every, every aspect of what his body uh, uh, you know, represents. Now, I'm not talking about eating a physical body. Uh, you know, for those that, 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 that might be there, go, oh, you know, but, you know, here we go again. You know, I'm not talking about eating a physical body. And Jesus wasn't talking about eating a physical body. He was talking about eating a spiritual body. He was talking about consuming what his body was going to pay for and what, what his body was, was going to establish, uh, uh, you know, through this process of the crucifixion, his burial, and his resurrection. Uh, that, that we could devour it and then live in a newness of life. All right? And so, you know, if you, if you move over here to John chapter 6 for a moment, and in John chapter 6, Jesus is talking to a multitude, uh, you know, a, multi, a multitude, a crowd of people. And, uh, and as he's talking, of course, you know, many disciples were, were with him, and, and, uh, and, he, and he's talking about being the bread of life. He's... He's talking about all that. But he says in John chapter 6 uh, and in verse 53. All right, John 6 and verse 53. And he says, I'm going to get to the right page here. And uh, in verse 53, he says, Then Jesus said to them, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man, and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Now, I don't know about you, but this is fascinating to me. Only God could have set this up because we know that in the original text, in the original manuscripts, there was no chapter and verse. And what's fascinating to me is that if you, in verse 53 of John 6, Jesus says, then Jesus said to them, Most assuredly I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man, and drink his blood, you have no life in you. It really points back to Isaiah 53. Verse 53. And many of his disciples left him. After he spoke uh, and said, you must drink, uh, eat my flesh and drink my blood. Many of his disciples. Verse uh, John 6, 66. Interesting. 6, 6, 6. All right. And, and many of his disciples left him. All right? And, and if you really think about it, the Jews have been blinded because many of the religious Jews do not even acknowledge Isaiah 53. They don't acknowledge Isaiah 53. Why? Because, because Isaiah 53 talks about the death, burial, and resurrection of the Messiah. Right? And we want the, the, the Jews to come to know the saving knowledge of Jesus. We want them to be so impacted. And I want to encourage, if you're, if you're listening online and, 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 you know, and, you're, and you're Jewish, I want to encourage you, and you've never received Messiah as your Lord and Savior, you have an opportunity, and He wants to open your eyes. He wants to remove the blindness and, and allow you to begin to see 
that the Messiah came and he shed his blood and he wants you to eat the flesh and drink the blood of Jesus. All right? And, and so Isaiah 53 talks about this, you know, and, and so he says, he says here again, let me read it again, Moshe surely, in other words, he's emphasizing something here. He's, he's making a declaration and he's saying, you know, that you, you know, it's a command. You, you, you're going to need to eat my flesh. You're going to need to drink my blood. For if you don't, there's no life in you. All right. See, the, the book of Leviticus tells us that, that life is found in the blood, right? And I want to suggest to you that only there's only life found in the blood of Jesus. Now, you might be living on the earth, but if you don't know Jesus, you're not living the life that he intended you to live. And so, you know, it, it's just time to receive Jesus. It's time to believe, right? And, and you know, confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, and he'll come in, and he'll impact your life, and he'll bring change in your life, you know? Um, but, but look at this. He says, eat my flesh and drink my blood. Otherwise, you have no life. You have no real life in you and I. Right? So when Jesus is saying to the disciples in Matthew 26 that, that I want you to take my body and I want you to eat it. He's suggesting to you and I, what is our appetite? Is our appetite to feed on him, or is our appetite to feed on something else? In other words, we've got to have an appetite that says, I want to continue to feed on Jesus until something changes in my life. I want to continue to feed on Jesus until, until my situations change. I'm going to continue to feed on Jesus until every circumstance uh, that I conquer, you know, until I conquer every situation, every circumstance, I'm going to continue to feed and have an appetite and a hunger and a desire for Jesus. Right? I'm just going to continue to feed on the body of Jesus, on the, on the bread of Jesus, the word of God. Right, The bread speaks of the word of God. So he wants us to digest this word. He wants us to read this word and digest it by the spirit of God. So that we can begin to have daily bread. And as we walk out that daily bread, things begin to shift and change in our life. Are you hungry? Right? See, if our appetite is not for the body of Jesus, for the bread of Jesus, then our appetite will be for the world. See, is it the word and testimony of Jesus or is the word and testimony of the world that has our appetite? Right? This is, in essence, what he's saying to the disciples. Because, because if our appetite is for worldly things, if our appetite is for, for the flesh, if our appetite is for, for that which has already been uh, crucified, if, uh, you know, in the sense of our, of our flesh, our old nature, if our appetite is still for the desires of, 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 and the memories of our old nature, then, then what will happen is, is we will live from a nature he never designed us to live from. And so he wants us to, to, to have an appetite for his word. He wants us to have an appetite for his bread. But you got to take his bread. you got to consume his bread. And you got to live his bread. Right? Then he says to the disciples in Matthew 26, he says, Then he took the cup and he gave thanks and he gave it to them saying, Drink from it all of you. For this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. For this is my blood of the covenant. Everybody say the covenant. The covenant. Right? The covenant is a blood covenant. It's a blood covenant. It's his blood being shed so that we can have a covenant with him. Wow. Right? Right? And so there's many different dimensions of where Jesus' blood was shed before he went to the cross. There's seven distinct places where Jesus shed his blood. All right. We talked about the first one a couple months ago in the Garden of Gethsemane. You know that in the Garden of Gethsemane that Jesus sweat droplets of blood. 
right? And, and, and basically, it was a place where Jesus surrendered. It was the place of pressure. And Jesus surrendered his will. In other words, his blood was shed so that we, you and I, could live by his will, in his will, and for his will. Let me say it again. He shed his blood in the Garden of Gethsemane so that we could live in his will, by his will, and for his will. So we talked about that. We talked about Jesus shed blood at the whipping post, where, where in, in Matthew uh, 26, uh, uh, in, uh, in verse, um, or uh, was, yeah, in, uh, no, verse, chapter 27, verse 26, where it says that he released Barabbas to them, and when he scourged Jesus, he delivered him to be crucified. In other words, Jesus was whipped. He was scourged at the whipping post, and that, and when he was whipped on, on his back, you know, we talked about this last month, that, that, uh, uh, that it speaks of healing. It speaks of, 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 of the healing of our bodies, the healing of our minds, the healing of our, of, of our, of our soul, the, the healing of all sickness and all disease. Everybody see healing. 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 Right? This is one of the most challenging uh, uh, dimensions of the shed blood of Jesus, I believe, in the church. We can receive the, 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 the aspect that he, you know, it's for the remission of sins, but we struggle with the healing of our bodies. We struggle with, the, with this dimension of healing that, oh, is it God's will or is it not God's will? Well, it is God's will. Plain and simple because Jesus took the whip, you know, the, the lashings, uh, you know, 40 less one. Uh, right? He took the lashings on his back so that we could be healed. I mean, in Psalm 103, 3, it says that, that he forgives all of our iniquities and heals all of our diseases. Uh, you know, I mean, I, mean, I mean, for him to say that uh, means that he's being truthful and honest and declaring his character. And he's integral. He's faithful, uh, you know, in, 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 in what he declares in his word. He's faithful in regards to his character. But you and I, we've got to believe that it's his will to heal all sickness and disease. All right, we talked about that last month. And, but tonight I want to talk about the third place where Jesus shed his blood. So let's go to Matthew chapter 27. Matthew 27. And let's read the text here, starting in verse 27. It says, Then the soldiers of the governor took Jesus into the praetorium and gathered the whole garrison around him. And they stripped him and put a scarlet robe on him. And when they had twisted a crown of thorns, they put it on his head and a reed in his right hand, and they bowed the knee before him and mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews. Then they spat on him and took the reed and struck him on the head. And when they had mocked him, they took the robe off him, put his own clothes on him, and led him away to be crucified. And, you know, so this third place where Jesus sheds his blood is the place where they put the crown of thorns on his head. Now, I don't know if you understand that, that this crown of thorns, it, you know, as they, as they twisted it together, the thorns were long thorns. They weren't like these short little thorns you get on a rose book. They were, they were probably anywhere from an inch to two inch, two inches long. And as they began to press it down upon his head, they would pierce his head and, and, and blood would come out. I mean, just think of the torture of that. I mean, I mean Jesus is going through this. And what's fascinating to me, as I said before, the, here's the enemy playing out something that's actually bringing healing to something. Yeah, I right? Yeah. He's, he, he's, he's, he's causing something to take place to Jesus, and, and, and yet, and yet uh, in the process of the blood of Jesus being shed, Jesus is restoring us back to uh, and, and reversing the curse. Right? The crown of thorns represents... Uh, uh, the mindset or the, the, the concept of poverty. Everybody say poverty. poverty. Right? It was a symbol of poverty. All right? And, and so, you know, when we think of poverty, uh, when did poverty come into the earth? Well, let's just go there. Let's go to Genesis chapter 3. Genesis chapter 3. Because Jesus is, is, you know, this whole concept of of this crown of thorns are right, being placed on Jesus, you know, is, is something the enemy's, you know, trying to do to accomplish something. 
Uh, but God's turning it around for his good. He's reversing something that had been declared uh, in the earth, all right? And we know that when Adam sinned, all right, uh, you know, Adam sins and, and uh, um, you know, through deception, you know, Eve and, and, and then Adam sins and, uh, and they come down and Jesus, you know, or the Lord comes down, speaks to Adam and he asks him three questions and stuff like that. But let's, let's go to the story uh, in verse 17. Genesis 3, verse 17, says, Then to Adam he said, Because you have heeded the voice of your wife, and have eaten from the tree of which I commanded you, saying, You shall not eat of it, cursed is the ground for your sake, in toil you shall eat of it all the days of your life, both thorns and thistles, thorns and thistles, thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you. All right? And you shall eat the herb of the field. In the sweat of your face you shall eat bread till you return to the ground. For out of it you were taken, for dust you are, and to dust you shall return. Now I want to pull some prophetic things out of this. I want to, I want to pull a few things out uh, of this passage of scripture. But first thing I want to say is this. Look in verse 17. And he says to Adam, because you have heeded the voice of your wife. Now, guys, this is not uh, a statement that we're not to listen to our wives. All right? <laughs> you know? <laughs> All right? But, but listen to this. this. The reason why I believe God said this was because he listened to Eve above the voice yes. of himself, of yeah. the voice of God. All right? This is why he says it. In other words, Adam was spoken to and told, do not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And then he passed that on to his wife. All right? And so, so God's addressing something here that he listened to his wife. He listened to another voice above what God had already spoken to him. All right? And, and this, is, this is so powerful because if you and I will listen to another voice, we'll live from a curse. All right? We'll live from a curse. Now, now there's many people in the body of Christ that say, well, the curse no longer exists and, and all that sort of stuff. I want to suggest to you that, that blessing and cursing still exists. Amen. It still exists. And even as believers, and you're going to see this play out, as believers, we have a choice to either live in the blessing or to live in the cursing. Just, yes, Jesus paid the price. Yes, he did it all. But we have a choice. Say, I have a choice. I have a choice. Right? And, and it's interesting to me that, that, that what, what this literally represents. The word curse here means can mean to separate all right in other words it's a separation so there were, so what happened here cursed is the ground for your sake in other words remember the story adam was called to tend and keep the garden right to guard and keep the garden now the sudden the ground becomes cursed okay now in other words there a separation took place between Adam and the ground. Mm. Separation took place between Adam and God. Separation took place between Adam and his wife. Separation took place between Adam and other relationships. All right? Okay, now, let's continue to look at it. So, so what, what happens here? Right? They're told not to eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. All right? So, the key is we must listen and heed God's voice above any other voice. Yes. We must heed, listen and heed God's voice above any other voice. All right? Now, if you remember the story of after Adam sins, what happens? As soon as they sin, they live in fear. Or they say curse. curse. Right? The curse. All right? They began to live in fear. Say poverty. poverty. Fear is poverty. Yes, sir. See, many in the world think poverty is a lack of money. 
And many in the church think that way too. Well, you know, we should be poor. We shouldn't, you know, have money. We shouldn't. Have. That's not what Jesus ever said. I, right? Here's the key. Poverty and prosperity are mindsets. Before Adam ate from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, all Adam had was a prosperity mindset. He, all Adam had was a prosperity mindset. He had no lack. Think about this for a minute. He's in the garden full of fruit, full of vegetation, full of animals, right? I mean, full of an abundance that, you know, all the seeds would continue to reproduce and all he had to do was guard and tend the garden. Say full of resources. Full of resources. Right? Full of abundance. Right? There was no lack. There was no lack of resource. There was no lack of God's presence. There was no lack of God's empowerment. There was no lack of, of, of being fruitful. There was no lack of, of multiplication. There was no lack of filling the earth. There was no lack of, of anything. All right? But when they ate from the tree of knowledge of good and evil, that's when poverty came in. And the first emotion they sensed was fear. When, see, getting back to Jesus reversed the curse, he, 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 you know, wearing the crown of thorns, he shed his blood to reverse the curse of poverty in our life. So every time we live out of fear, we're living below and in the curse rather than in the blessing. Ah, that's powerful. Let me say it this way. There are only three mindsets that we find in Scripture. Three. And two of them always are a part of the, the poverty mindset. The three are a barbarian mindset, a Greek mindset, or a Hebrew mindset. A barbarian mindset is one that lives out of control, manipulation, and fear. I would say poverty. poverty. Right? If you think about that, you know, how many communist nations, right, dictatorships, right, that, that we have in the world, and they rule by what? Fear, intimidation, control, Amen. right? And they're in poverty. Right? All of them are in poverty. Right? The people, particularly. Now, they might be wealthy in the sense of finances, but they're in poverty because they have lack. I got to hold on to it. I got to hoard it all. It's for me. And, and, and so they hoard it to themselves. Right? If, you, if you think about it, you know, dictatorships have lots of money. Right? But they're poor in mindset. They're in poverty because they're living out of fear. They're living out of control, intimidation, and, and manipulation. All right? That's the first mindset that we discover in the scriptures. The second mindset is Greek. In other words, humanistic in thinking and thinking outside of God. That's how the Greeks think. You know, if you, if you understand the philosophers, Socrates and uh, Sigmund Freud and all the, all, all the different philosophers, they lived, they lived outside of the mind of God. They lived in a humanistic thinking. I mean, that's really what our culture in, in North America, particularly in Canada, lives from, is a humanistic. Uh, and, and somewhere in there is also the barbarian uh, mindset, uh, intimidation, control. That's what's taking place in our nation right now. Um, and, uh, you know, but, but it also lives on a humanistic mindset. And that knowledge is power. Right? That's the way the Greeks think. That's where Western is considered a Western mindset. All right? And that's particularly what you and I have been raised in in North America. is a Greek, humanistic, uh, knowledge is power. Guess what? I'm, I'm going to break that right now and say knowledge is not power. You can have all the knowledge you want, and if you have all the knowledge in the world that you want, you might rule, but you're going to live from a poverty mindset. How many millionaires and billionaires live from a poverty mindset? Many. 
You can, I think we'd be surprised at how many have a poverty mindset. Lottery winners. Lottery winners, same thing. Poverty, right? If you, if you actually study it out, I remember when I was in Africa, and, uh, you know, it just happened to be, as we were eating one night, the, the TV was on, and it was a program talking about, um, you know, as we're sitting in this uh, kind of where we were staying, in this restaurant area, and, uh, and this, it was talking about uh, people that have, had won the lottery. Oh, yeah. and, uh, and there was, I think they listed 10 people, and out of the 10, nine of them were yeah. broke. <laughs> right? Because you can, I mean, th- let, let me say it this way. You can make $5,000 a year and be in poverty, but you can make $6 billion a year and still be in poverty. Because it's not about how much or how little we have. It's about the way we think. All right, yeah. it's it's all in the mind. All right, so so thinking outside of God. All right, that's the Greek mindset, and then the Hebrew mindset, you know, basically in essence brings us to the mind of Christ. All right, thinking the way God thinks. How many want to think the way God thinks? All right, see what mindset we live from will determine whether we're living out of the curse or the blessing. See, if we have an appetite for the body and blood of Jesus, we'll live out of prosperity. But if we have an appetite for the knowledge of good and evil, we'll live, live out of death. Let me, let me say that the tree of the knowledge of good and evil is death. That's what happened to Adam and Eve. They died. Right? They died spiritually. But when they, you know, uh, you know, but if we eat from the tree of life, Jesus, we eat his word eat his body and his blood then then we'll live from a prosperity mindset I know prosperity has been blown out of proportion and and there's been a misconception and a misuse of of of, of that but first and foremost their mindsets all right and and Adam all he had was a prosperity mindset before sin and now he's got a poverty mindset well Jesus shed his blood so that he could restore us back to a prosperity mindset. See, by eating from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, it is much more than eating a piece of fruit. It's about grabbing a hold of and seizing knowledge of good and evil above God. Every time we grab a hold of and seize the knowledge of good and evil above God, we choose to live in poverty. We see here that Adam had become intimate with with consuming the fruit of knowledge of good and evil. And so his mindset was no longer on God fully. It was now on good and evil. We were never created to know good and evil. That might challenge some of us. You and I were never created to know good and evil. All we were created for was to know God. Because in knowing Him, we have all that we need. In knowing Him, we have all that we need. And so Jesus, you know, in this moment of shedding His blood, is returning us back to knowing Him. To knowing that He is all we need. All right? That he is all we need. Because in God, there is no lack. And there is no poverty in God. No fear. And no fear. No worry. I mean, let me say this. If you and I worry, we're living out of a poverty mindset. Which means we're living in the curse. Hmm. Just say it. No condemnation. Because we all struggle with this. Right? Right? We're all growing. We're all developing, right? So, the Apostle Paul said this. He said in First Corinthians two, he says, you know, uh, you know, it was the cruci- uh, Sorry, let's go there. First Corinthians chapter two. So you see this. He comes to the, the the church at Corinth and he's speaking to the people there, and he says to them, in First Corinthians chapter two, verse one, he says. And I, brethren, when I came to you, did not come with excellence of speech or of wisdom, 
declaring to you the testimony of God. For I determined not to know anything among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. Yes, right? The Apostle Paul is stating that he wants to know Jesus Christ and him crucified. And he came to the church at Corinth knowing Jesus Christ and him crucified. How many want to know Jesus Christ and him crucified? Mm -hmm. Right? And we've got to consume his body and his blood. See, how much do we know intimately Christ crucified above anything else? It was the crucifixion that restored us to life. It was the crucifixion that gave us the ability to have the Holy Spirit in us and upon us. And his shed blood from the crown of thorns restores you and I back to the mind of Christ instead of a poverty mindset. Go back to Genesis 3. Cursed is the ground, and in toil you shall eat of it all the days of your life. All the days of whose life? Man, all of it. Now watch this. Watch this. This is so prophetic. Look at what he says. Genesis 3. Verse 17, curse is the ground for your sake, and toil you shall eat of it all the days of your life. All the days of whose life? Adam's life. All the days of our old nature life. When Jesus was crucified, when we received Jesus, our old nature, because the Bible says that we were crucified with Christ, Right? We were buried with Christ. Jesus is the last Adam. Yeah. Right? Who's he? He's talking to the first Adam. We've got to get a revelation of this. Right? That, that cursed is the ground to the old nature. Not to you and I as believers. But we can choose to live from that perspective. Remember, Jesus reversed the curse. All right? So he reversed the curse. He reversed the curse. Right? Did he or did he not? He did. Right? He did. Now, uh, he reversed the curse wholly and completely, but we're still in the process of walking that out. All right? I like to say it this way. If you look at when sin came in, Right? After Adam and Eve sinned, all of the repercussions of that sin still was being walked out as generation after generation after generation after generation. To when Jesus shows up on the scene and, and then dies, a new generation started. According to Matthew uh, chapter 1, 14 generations and 14 generations and 14 generations. And the last generation is, is, is the Christ. Right? So in other words, something shifted that when Jesus died on the cross, the curse had been reversed, and we're still in the process of walking that reversal out. Come on. Right? How many of you are recognizing in your own life you're still trying to walk the reversing of that curse? Right? In other words, we're all in this process of, of, of walking out the reversal of the curse. All right? But he says, all the days of your life, all the days of whose? Adam's life, mankind's life. So the world that, you know, when, when we don't receive Jesus, then the world will live the same, right? But if we receive Jesus, then we will live by the last Adam, because according to Galatians chapter 2, verse 20, it says, I was crucified with Christ, but the life I now live, I live, right? It's no longer I that live, but Christ that lives in me. me. It's Christ that lives in me. It's not Adam that lives in me. It's Christ that lives in me. And so the life I now live, I live by the faith of the one who gave up his life for us. Right? Our problem is, is we still continue to live like Adam in the curse instead of the freedom Jesus paid for.
In the sweat of your face, you shall eat bread till you return to the ground. Well, we were already buried with Christ. Hmm. Right? We no longer have to live from a poverty mindset. We no longer have to live from lack. We can live from the abundance of Christ. We can live from the abundance of His Word. We can live from the abundance of His blood. We can live from the abundance of His bread. We can live from the abundance of His life. Listen to this. Verse 17. In toil. Everybody say in toil. Right, you shall eat of it. All the days of your life. In toil. The word toil here means sorrow. It, it, in the Hebrew, it can also mean labor, pain, worrisomeness and its root word means to worry or grieve so if we're in worry then we're toiling from the wrong mindset we are how many know we're called to toil but from God's mindset yes right right see toil when when God created the garden and he, and he gave the garden to man and he, and he said guard it, tend it, keep it. He, he said work. Work the garden. Right? In other words, work's not bad. No. It's when we got to toil. Yes. It's when we got to sweat to, 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 get, to get by. It's when we got to you know, uh, do all the effort in our own strength. But how many know Jesus died and shed his blood so that we could have his strength? I can do all things through who strengthens me, right? So no longer am I living in worry. No longer am I living in fear and anxiety. For these are a product of the curse, and Jesus reversed the curse. Yes. Fear, worry, and anxiety, and lack are part of the poverty mindset. Flip over to Psalm 23. Psalm 23. David write, writes this song, psalm and he says this. He says, I'm just going to do the first verse. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. Another translation says, I shall not lack. If you look up that word want, listen to what it means. It literally means to lack to fail, to make lower, and to lessen. When the Lord is our shepherd, I shall not lack, I shall not fail, I shall not be made lower, and I shall not be lessened. The word shepherd there means ruler. It means to... Um, to be a companion, to keep company with, to pastor, to feed and to tend, and to associate as with a friend. In other words, the Lord is my ruler, and I shall not lack. I shall not be made lower. I shall not be lessened. I shall not fail. Amen. Right? Because he's my ruler. He's, you know, just as that word that was sung tonight, you know, that, that you know, he's the author and the finisher. You know, what the work he began, he will finish it, right? But it comes out of surrender. It comes out of this, Lord, you're my ruler. Victory in Jesus. Right? Then, then he's not just my ruler, he's my companion. Right? In other words, if, you know, the Lord is my companion, I shall not lack. Why? Because he's with me every day. He's there strengthening me. Right? Which means I don't have to live out of the curse of poverty. I can live out of the, out of the prosperity of his presence, out of the prosperity of, 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 his, of his nurturing, out of the prosperity of his friendship, out of the prosperity of, of his rulership, out of the prosperity of his, of his, of his feeding. Is looking after me. Look with me to Deuteronomy 30. Let's 
finish this up so we can celebrate tonight and partake and dig in and consume. And he paid the price. He shed the blood. So I don't have to live in the curse of poverty. Jesus. Deuteronomy 30, the real, a very familiar passage. He says here to the Israelites, he says in verse 19, I call heaven and earth as witnesses today. Everybody say today. today. Right? Against you that, that I've set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore choose life. life that both you and your descendants may live, that, that you may love the Lord your God, with, that you may obey his voice, and that you may cling to him, for he is your life and length of your days, and that you may dwell in the land which the Lord swore to your fathers, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, to give them. Mm -hmm. Everybody say today. today. See, today. what you and I choose today will determine whether we live out of the prosperity of his shed blood or out of the poverty of the curse. Mm -hmm. Remember, life is found in what? The blood. The blood. Notice what he says here. I set before you life. I set before you the blood of Jesus. I set before you the blood that was shed through the crown of thorns that's set before us today Will we choose po poverty or will we choose prosperity? Yes. Mm. Wow. Right? Will we choose blessing or will we choose cursing? Notice, he, look, look what he says to them. He says, therefore, choose. He wants everyone to choose life. He wants everyone to consume his blood. Right? He wants all of us to consume his blood so that we do not worry, so that we do not fret, so that we do not uh, live in anxiety, so that we do not you know, live out of fear. Right? But we live out of faith and love and, and his empowerment and his blessings. The choice is ours. He's chosen abundance for us. He's chosen blessing for us. Will we accept, grab a hold of, and seize his life through the shed blood of Jesus? Yes. Or will we choose death and poverty and lack? Yes. Mm -hmm. His blood was shed so that we would love the Lord with all of our heart. Amen. Right? Verse um, 20 there. That you may love the Lord your God, that you may obey his voice. He shed his blood so that we would love the Lord and so that we would obey his voice and that we may cling to him yes. right that we may cling to what he paid for cling to his blood cling to his his presence cling to to his life cling to to all that he paid for psalm 35 Psalm 35, verse 27 says this. Let them shout for joy and be glad who favor my righteous cause. And let them say continually, let the Lord be magnified who has pleasure in, in the prosperity of his servant. Let them shout for joy and be glad who favor my righteous cause. And let them continually, let the Lord be magnified. You know, we magnify the Lord when we receive and grab a hold of what he paid for. Amen. We magnify the Lord when we receive his life. We magnify the Lord when we receive his body and we grab a hold and we consume and we live from his body. We, we, we magnify the Lord every time we, we, we uh, live from what his blood paid for and out of the forgiveness and the, uh, of iniquity and sin and, and out of the healing of every disease and every sickness and, 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 and believing and walking in, in that dimension, the Lord gets magnified uh, because he has pleasure in the prosperity of his servants, right? He, he, he pleasures in our prosperity. He pleasures the, that when we live from a prosperity mindset, he pleasures that. He pleasures when we live in the abundance of his mind, when we live in the abundance of his life. When we, you know, Jesus said, I come that you may have life and have life 
more right. abundant. He pleasures when we live in abundance. Yes. Right? In abundance of soul, in the abundance of the spirit, in the abundance of his presence, in the abundance of, of, of what his blood paid for. Last scripture, Galatians 6. Galatians 6. Remember, he shed his blood so that the curse of poverty would be reversed. Galatians chapter 6. Oh, yeah. Galatians 6. Look at this. Verse, verse 7. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, yes. that he will also reap. Yes. For he who sows to his flesh. So he who sows to a poverty mindset yes. will of the poverty mindset reap corruption. Mm. Right? So if we sow into fear... We'll live out of fear and corruption. We'll decay. We'll, we'll you know, live in ruin. But if we, if we sow to the Spirit, in other words, sow into that prosperity mindset of, of Christ, the, the, the mindset in the, in, you know, uh, of receiving and grabbing a hold of, of what His blood paid for, we will reap everlasting life. The ability to know the Father and Jesus as the Christ. Notice it says, and let us not grow weary while doing good. For in due season we shall reap if we do not lose heart. Hmm. Amen. Let me say this. Jesus sowed his life to destruction so that our life could be sown into the Spirit. When all sin came upon him, mm, Jesus conquered the curse of poverty Amen. by shedding his blood. Now all we have to do is receive, believe, yes. accept, yes. grab a hold of, seize the blood that was shed, consume it, and live by the power of the Holy Spirit. Yes. And in due season we shall reap the ability to know and have deeper communion with Him in every dimension of our life. I mean, tonight, I want to give up some fear. Amen. How many tonight want to give up some worry? How many tonight want to give up lack and receive his abundance, the abundance of his blood, the concentrated blood of Jesus that was shed through the crown of thorns so that we can live out of the prosperity of his presence, the prosperity of his friendship, the prosperity of, of relationship with him so that we would no longer sweat by the sweat of our brow that we would live by the strength and the power of the Holy Spirit to live the life he created us to live. No longer having an appetite for the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, but having an appetite for the body and blood of Jesus. Let's pray. Father, tonight we come before you as we celebrate communion we celebrate as we prophetically act out, Lord. What your body and blood paid for as we prophetically receive, grab a hold of and seize, <coughs> consume and devour and live. Yes. Amen. Consume through drinking of your blood. Spiritually, that would begin to impact those areas of lack in our life. That would begin to impact those areas of, of worry, those areas of, of lack, those areas of fear and anxiety. Yes. So, Father, we ask tonight that your blood would be poured into those areas of our life. And that you would wash those areas as white as snow we may live in 
choose to live in your life. For in you, there is no lack. In you, there's only you to pour into us tonight, Lord, as we eat together and as we drink together. In Jesus' name, amen. John, you want to pass the uh, stuff around, please? around here. The Lord is our shepherd. I shall not lack. Hmm. So on the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took the bread. He blessed it, he broke it, he gave it. And he said, take eat, for this is my body. So Lord, tonight, we take your bread, your word, your body. And we prophetically, through this act of eating, we eat together, we consume, we digest. You just didn't leave us with your word. But you left us your blood. So that we can drink, receive, and grab a hold of, consume, and absorb, and assimilate. These areas that your blood was shed so that we could live the life you created us to live. I came that you may have life and have it more abundant. And Lord, we know that life is in the blood. Life is in the blood of Jesus. And so tonight we partake tonight of your life. We partake of your blood. And Father, as we partake tonight, Father, I just speak healing over bodies. Lord God, that even as we drink tonight, that healing would manifest as we expect the unexpected. Sins would be forgiven. Worry, fear, and anxiety would be removed. And that the choice of life blessing today will be received accepted from the hold of and live from and in Jesus name let's drink together just give you glory tonight. We thank you for your body. We thank you for your blood. Let us have an appetite every day for your word. And every day for your spirit. And every day for your mind. Your thoughts. Your will. And your emotions. In Jesus' mighty and powerful name. Everybody said? Amen.
Amen. Amen. God bless you. Be strengthened. We look forward to seeing you Tuesday night Bible study. And, uh, you know, as we dig in deeper to prosperity of the soul. And uh, so 7 o'clock uh, Zoom or here at 125 Blackburn Drive. God bless you. Have a great week. And we look forward to seeing you next Sunday night as well. 6 o'clock as we go into worship and, and then uh, the word uh, sometime after worship. God bless you. Have a great week. Amen. Amen. Yes. Amen. Amen.